the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farrow. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m., where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11 p.m. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11 p.m., seven nights a week. No spin, no bias, no censorship. This is Dan Wooten tonight with me, Patrick Christie's. Coming up, Westminster is wobbling over reports of more Liz Truss U-turns on the mini-budget, including a mooted hike on corporation tax. So, faced with a choice of a floundering Tory party and socialist hell with Labour, are you now losing faith in politics? Who would you vote for? Would you vote at all? I will be polling you, the electorate, our people my people in the clash at 9.20. Meanwhile, amid rumours of a Sunak mordant coup, that's right, the kind of military coup that Rwanda might be proud of, the Foreign Secretary has issued this warning about ousting the Prime Minister despite all the turmoil. I think that changing the leadership would be a disastrously bad idea, not just uh, politically but also economically. But let's face it, people, it could be a lot worse. Just a little quick video made up. Would you like to see it? America is a nation that can be defined in a single word. Y'all ready for this? I was going to put him in uh, the foot. Good grief. He looks like someone needs to take him to the vet for one last trip. So, should we, in fact, be grateful to have Liz Truss in charge? I'll debate that at 10 with my superstar panel, former Tory London mayoral candidate Sean Bailey, author and journalist. Amy Nicole and political commentator who's filled in at very short notice, thank you very much, is Albi Amancone. Yes, that's right. And, of course, is the current Tory infighting and betrayal of Conservative values doing a disservice to the memory of the late, great Sir David Amos, who dedicated almost 40 years to parliamentary service before his murder at the hands of an Islamist extremist? Political firebrand and a close friend of Sir David and Whittacombe pays tribute, and we're also going to be asking as well, given the fact that Islamist extremism appears to have slipped off the agenda, where we're all at with that. Has terrorism gone away? I think not. That's ahead of the first anniversary of his death, and that comes at 9.40. And, as a record, 7 million people are revealed to be waiting to start routine hospital treatment. Shocking stuff, this. Is the NHS spiralling into oblivion? Uh, yeah. I'll explore that in my digest next. You don't want to miss that. And. After 856 migrants crossed the channel on Wednesday, is the government's plan to send asylum seekers to Rwanda within just three weeks a glimmer of hope for the silent majority being ignored over their illegal immigration fears? You're not going to be silenced on this show. Fleet Street legend Calvin McKenzie sounds off in The Outsider at 9.50 as former Health Secretary Sajid Javid makes this shocking admission. Would I have done it any differently? Yeah, looking back at now, no, absolutely not. Wouldn't do anything differently, really? Mm, not sure about that. Should the government apologise, reimburse and reinstate the tens of thousands of care workers forced out by the vaccine mandates? Absolutely. Professor of Evidence-Based Medicine at the University of Oxford, Carl Hennigan, is leading the charge for justice alongside the Together Declaration. He joins me at 10.20. It's box office stuff, this people. As a new report finds a culture of fear is preventing the expression of free speech in UK universities. Well, intellectual unfitness, a term coined by tonight's uncancelled guest, doom the next generation. We should never be too afraid to say what we think. Social media sensation Zuby is right here at 10.40 plus after the home of the European Parliament attempts to cancel Jesus and limits the sale of crucifixes at its Christmas market. Is wokeism determined to kill off Christianity? Jesus now isn't woke. Yeah, I know, I know. Anyway, we'll have that and a first look at tomorrow's front pages today in the media buzz at 10.30. 
And as always, I hold the power tonight. I'm in charge, but I won't let it go to my head or anything. It's down to me to crown the final Greatest Britain and Union jackass of the week before the night is out. This is Dan Watson tonight. I am Patrick Christie's. Let's go. Just one thing first, though, actually. Football's equivalent of David Dickinson, the BBC's Ramona in chief, rampant left winger, pun intended. Gary Lineker has officially broken BBC impartiality guidelines. Gary likes to tweet sickeningly worthy, woke, lefty tosh from the comfort of his multi-million pound mansion so he can curry favour with his lovely friends and justify his massive privilege and huge pay packet by trying to come across like a really nice guy. It's very easy to think that you have all the answers and think that Brexiteers are racist bigots when you don't have to worry about money, a job, and you can afford to live in an area that simply isn't affected by mass migration. Anyway, Gary tweeted about the Tory party taking Russian money and now he's officially been found to have finally broken BBC impartiality rules. The BBC said, through gritted teeth, one would imagine, we expect these individuals to avoid taking sides on party political issues or political controversies and to take care when addressing public policy matters. Yeah, all right, it took me a few years to say that, didn't it? There we go. My digest coming up and then my superstar panel. I've got former London mayoral candidate Sean Bailey, author and broadcaster Amy Nickell, there you go, and Conservative commentator who's filled in at very short notice, it must be said, Albie Ammon Kona. But first, it's the news with the equally wonderful Polly Middlehurst. Patrick, thank you. Good evening to you. The Chancellor is insisting the government's position on the economy has not changed. That's ahead of the Bank of England's support measures coming to an end tomorrow. Kwasi Kwarteng says his focus is on delivering the mini-budget amid reports of a government U-turn on the plan. The Prime Minister is urged to reconsider measures by some Tory members of the 1922 committee, leading to speculation Liz Truss's own position could be in jeopardy. International Trade Secretary Kemi Badenoch says it's important her party works together. Even talking about changing uh, leaders at this time would be disastrous. We should not be talking about that at all. We should be focusing on what is important for people's lives, uh, for their jobs uh, and for their prosperity. It's time to unite, get behind the Prime Minister and focus on her growth agenda. Well, away from politics, a court has been hearing today how a nurse accused of murdering several babies wrote, I am evil and I killed them on purpose on notes written to herself found during a search of her home. Lucy Letby is charged with the murder of seven babies and the attempted murder of ten others at the Countess of Chester Hospital across 2015 and 2016. Her defence counsel today telling Manchester Crown Court she cared deeply about the babies and loved her job. 32-year-old Letby denies all allegations. In international news, in Ukraine, the newly installed Russian governor of Kherson has appealed to residents to evacuate amid advancing Ukrainian forces. Kherson is one of four partially occupied regions Russia claims to have annexed following President Putin's so-called referenda. Vladimir Saldo has publicly called for the Kremlin's help to send civilians to safer parts of Russia. It's one of the starkest signs yet that Moscow is losing grip on the Ukrainian territory it claims to have taken over. Meanwhile, the Ukrainian government is urging citizens to prepare for more electrical blackouts. People are being asked to stock up on warm clothes, candles and batteries and cut down their electricity use as much as possible. In the United States, a jury is recommending a life sentence for a gunman who killed 17 people at a school in Florida four years ago. Nicholas Cruz, who was 19 at the time, used a semi-automatic weapon at Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland. He pleaded guilty to the murders of 14 of his fellow students and three members of staff. The government has said it's unlocked £100 million worth of export markets within the alcohol industry. The International Trade Department says it's intervened to end a number of barriers, including with several African and South American nations, such as in Argentina, where whisky tariffs were reduced from 35% to 20% following talks. 
And finally, the Queen Consort has carried out her first solo engagement in her new royal title. Camilla met with victims of domestic abuse at Chelsea Westminster Hospital in London. She also spoke with professionals in the field as well as other staff. And a worker for the charity Safe Live said Camilla was doing a wonderful job. That's it. You're up to date on TV, online and on DAB Plus Radio. You're with GB News, the People's Channel, where tonight Patrick Christus is sitting in for Dan Wooden tonight. Hello, everybody. Patrick Christie's here filling in for the legend himself, Dan Wotton. Now, there is a giant elephant in the room when it comes to our NHS. The headline figure is that there are 7 million people on a waiting list. That is 12% of the population of England and Wales. So on a street of 100 people in Britain, 12 of them are on a waiting list for NHS treatment. Why is this? Well, militant doctors' unions are queuing up to tell us that it's down to bad pay and poor working conditions. It's not. It's mainly down to COVID, specifically our response to it, which, by the way, was perpetuated by those in the medical community. Many of the same people who pumped COVID fear porn into our veins like a Class A drug. Many of those medical experts who hadn't bothered to ask Pfizer whether or not their vaccine actually stopped transmission of COVID. If you look behind the headline of these shocking NHS waiting times, you will see the truth. And the truth is that there isn't actually, believe it or not, a huge upsurge in the number of new people needing NHS care. No, this is a backlog of people who didn't get routine treatment because the NHS basically just became the national COVID service for two years. But this is where the elephant in the room really comes into its own, where it rears its trunk. Hospitals are carrying out 12% fewer operations and treatments than they were before the pandemic. They don't tell you that, do they, when they're all standing there with their hand out asking for more money? One more time, hospitals are carrying out 12% fewer operations and treatments than they were before the pandemic. And why is that, I wonder? Ah, uh, well, we, we reduced bed numbers during the COVID pandemic and we haven't returned them to normal yet. We also sacked NHS staff because they didn't get the COVID vaccine. So there are fewer staff as well, fewer beds, more patients waiting for treatment, all because of our response to the COVID crisis. The British taxpayer has done its bit for the NHS, as far as I'm concerned. The British taxpayer shut down his or her business for the NHS, didn't see his or her elderly relatives for the NHS, lost his or her job for the NHS, couldn't pay his or her mortgage for the NHS. And then the British taxpayer gave nurses two pay rises in two years. The British taxpayer increased the NHS budget by billions. The British taxpayer even gave consultants a 4.5% pay rise. But... Did you know that the British Medical Association surveyed consultants and 40% of them are thinking of leaving because they're not paid enough? They start on around 80k and work up, frankly, to any figure, pretty much. I actually spoke to the deputy chair for the BMA who represents consultants, who had the audacity to try to tell me that the government, the taxpayer, wasn't doing enough to pay consultants and he didn't even know how much they were paid. What does a consultant earn? What's the pay scale? Because like any job, you start lower down and you're earning your way up, don't you? Uh, yeah, so I actually haven't got the figures in front of me, but um, so, I, I, uh, so I think the pay scale um, is something which I'd have to go and check exactly. I wouldn't want to give the wrong but, information. But, but, just, it, it but, does... crucially, you do, but crucially, you don't think they're paid enough? Well, the, 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 it's not just me that thinks they're not paid enough. It's, it's consultants themselves when we surveyed them. The BMA surveyed consultants, those consultants who had a 4.5% pay rise said that they still didn't think they were being paid enough. You are the chair of the BMA Consultants Committee and you don't know what they're paid. Yeah, that's quite negligent, isn't it, really? Talking of negligent, actually, even those people lucky enough to get treatment might end up regressing it because there were 10,284 negligence claims last year. Now, of those, 12% were for maternity, so baby-related stuff. £8 billion will apparently be paid out for maternity cases. Another few billion for other cases as well. What's their excuse for people dying on their watch? Oh, well, we're all too tired, aren't we? There are procedural issues, they're overworked and they're underpaid. Take a little look at this NHS office. Well, it's all very, uh, very swish there. And if you actually go online and have a look at this clip with 
all of the sound on and things like that as well. You can see there are even signs around the place. Please, no problems today, it all says. Yes, OK. All those bickies on the table there and everything. All the, all the nice view there. Gosh, can you imagine what that must be costing them every single year, just in rent? There we are. Gosh, I mean, it's remarkable, isn't it? The NHS is not free, people. It is not free. It is one of the largest employers in Europe, and the taxpayer pays for it. You are paying for your health care, and you have the right to demand better. But there we go. To respond now is my superstar panel. It's former Conservative London mayoral candidate Sean Bailey. We've got author and broadcaster Amy Nicole and political commentator and co-founder of Conservatives Against Racism. It's Albie Amancona. I will start with you, Sean, and just ask you what you make of that. I could see at one point you were huffing and puffing a bit there. Was it the amount of negligence payments, I think, was it? It's quite... Look, the, the thing about the NHS, we value it. It is great, we need it, we want it, the public are behind it, but it's become too political, because any time mm. you talk about changing or whatever, someone from the Labour Party accuses you of privatisation and the conversation is dead. But the whole time that that's been going on, the NHS is slowly falling apart. If you take the issue of, of these waiting lists, um, the COVID period didn't start the waiting list, it just exacerbated mm. it. They, they existed beforehand, and it's because they have a lot of problems in the NHS. And the things I, I'd ask people in politics to really do are twofold. One, stop using NHS staff, particularly the most junior staff, as a political football. People keep saying, oh, they don't get paid enough. Work. Yes, they don't, but mm. let the NHS deal with that and, and, and then stop sort of using that as a reason to, to kill the conversation mm. and act like you're crusading on their part. Amy, I'll bring you in now. The NHS is not free. We all pay for it in the services and good. Enough. We do. Um, we do pay for it, but I'm not sure that enough of our taxes are going into it and being spent adequately um, because the major problem that the giant elephant, as mm. you put it... The one with the big is, trunk, yes. Um, I would say, my understanding is staff shortages. Um, there aren't enough staff. There aren't enough doctors. There aren't enough nurses. They're not training the doctors or nurses um, adequately. So that is the result of what, everything that you've talked about. I think that you're making the wrong enemy. Oh, I'm not trying to make an enemy. I'm just trying to point out... it sounded a lot like well, you were well, levelling a lot against... Well, you see, very it's, an interesting, the... it's an interesting one, that, because, actually, I think you make a good point, but who is trying to make an enemy out of who? Because, Albie, I'll bring you in here now. If nurses go on strike, and there is a ballot out at the minute, whether or not they enact on that is a different thing, but if nurses go on strike, people die. And I find that difficult. If I went on strike, no-one would care. People would have a night off, right? But, actually, I'm not a nurse. <laughs> we... Their job is more important. And I, I think they'd make an enemy out of us if they do that. Yes, of course, but I don't actually think we're going to get to a situation where the nurses go on strike. I hope common sense can prevail and that there can be some agreement between the medical unions and the health secretary. Look, the NHS has been in crisis every winter for as long as I can remember. Yeah. I don't think the COVID crisis was the thing that made the NHS a problem. The problem with the N NHS is we've got this demographic problem in the United Kingdom where we've got an ageing population and a shrinking, a shrinking labour force, which means that the tax take to pay for public services is getting smaller and smaller as time goes on. And that means what we need to be looking at are how we can reform public services, how we can reform the NHS. But as Sean said, mm. as soon as anyone mentions from the Tory side NHS reform, you get cries from the left about privatisation, when actually we need to be looking at the innovations that we see in Europe and also in Israel, and how we can actually make our health system the best in the world. But I think historically we have heard pri uh, reform translated to privatisation, mm. that's kind of what we've got over the past 12 years. That's what we've come to understand. Is the NHS still free at the point with of With good views. reasons. That's of course it is, but at the moment, we, over COVID, we subsidise the private healthcare companies but millions. Yeah, yeah because we they, are provided, pushing, they provided, they provided a service. Every time, every time you, 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 you berate the NHS and you deny these staff shortages and the fact that we need to put more into NHS and the government... I'm, I'm sorry, well, I'm sorry. Hold, hold on, hold on. Let, let's, let's, let's get Let's get some facts. Mm. Those private businesses provided um, a, a capacity the NHS didn't have. Half the reason the NHS doesn't have the capacity is because our doctors go and work on the private when it suits them, when we paid for their but training. why would That's they number do one. that? Number two, I, I, for, for consultants, I don't, I don't... I have no truck with this, this conversation that they don't get paid enough. It's they ridiculous. make they significant do. sums of that's money. That's why they're a consultant. But that's why you need to keep it but that also, way. No, but they, they Sean, too much Sean I don't think you can simultaneously argue that you don't want consultants to go to the private sector when they can get paid more. Precisely. 
I and say, then say that we shouldn't no, be raising we, our wages, you, wages in the public sector. I tell you why I say that, because we pay for their training. Mm. That's why I say no, that. No, I take your that's point, I say but that. I, Hold I on, let me just think the two but, arguments but, but the sub, the, the, the subsequent, the real point I want to make is mm. that the, the, the people of this country pay £140 billion pounds annually to the NHS. It isn't being spent properly. It's then argued about politically, but really mm. we should be separating the NHS and let okay. them deal with it properly. Without uh, politics. Amy, I, I wish I was doing this show on a Saturday because I could have criticised the NHS all I'd want, but there'd be no one at work to actually hear it, would there? We live in a country where you're much worse off getting ill at the weekend. We're a first world country, for goodness sake. Is it not fair enough to say that, yes, for all the good work they do, we shouldn't be too shy in saying some medical professionals are in it for the money and not patient care? I don't like this at all. At the moment, oh. you've got one nurse doing the job oh, of three. <laughs> you know, I kind of do feel slightly like I want to cry because this is such a massive misunderstanding and it's a disservice, surely, to our doctors and nurses who, a few months ago, we were... Seven million people. And I would Waiting. say, Patrick, I would say, Dodgy Patrick, hip. that I think I think levelling our anger at NHS this employees. This is exactly my point. What about the management? Well, the management. I think mm. that is really where we need to be focusing on: is what our management doing mm. in order to get the efficiencies that we need? Is it really fiscally prudent in a time when resources are stretched mm. to be spending lots of money on diversity officers? Well, thank you very much. Is, yes. it, is it really prudent to rainbow, be going back rainbow on, pedestrian? Crossing. Is it really prudent to be going back on the sugar strategy and the smoking strategy, which will reduce the demand drivers on the NHS in the long term mm. at a time when we're seeing the NHS in trouble? We really need to be thinking about this in a much more grown-up way. And I've got something that will make me smile. We can have to do it quickly. Is Wes Streeting and his, um, put forward his proposals to expand staff, modernise the NHS. Great. How's he paying for it? We'd love it. <laughs> there, 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 there is, there is and nobody... And he's sad again. He's sad again, yeah. <laughs> there is nobody, including me, who wouldn't love to see there more staff on NHS and, and more service provided, but I just want to hear Wes explain exactly how we're going to pay for that. That's well, we all, to be fair, we all do, and we're going to have to move on now. But one of the things that I speak about almost every day is this NHS thing, and I have a medical professional on this. People are leaving. And what is becoming crystal clear to me is they seem to be leaving for pretty much one of three countries, which is Australia, Canada, or America, where. Uh, apart with the exception of uh, America, of course, which is basically all privatised, and you've got other countries there with a, where there's less of a workload and the pay is bigger, so nicer working conditions. They're not leaving for other European countries. It's not like British nurses here or British doctors here are being, you know, whipped within an inch of their life compared to people elsewhere. It's more the profession as a whole as opposed to exactly the way we are treating our professionals. But anyway, coming up... Is the current Tory infighting and betrayal of Conservative values, like what we're seeing over immigration, for example, doing a disservice to the memory of Sir David Amos? Political firebrand and a close friend of the late politician, Anne Widdicombe, pays tribute ahead of the first anniversary of his death at 9.40. But first, faced with the choice of a U-turning Tory party and the socialist hell of Labour, are you losing faith in politics? TV presenter and actress Jenny Barnett, Conservative commentator Alex Dean and director of the Climate Analysis Group, Car26, Lois Perry, they will be joining me. And also, I'm going to be polling you, the electorate, the people, my people, in The Clash next. That email address, and I'm annoyed about this because he's not got my name in it, Dan, at gbnews.uk. Where is he? Anyway, Dan at gbnews.uk <laughs> or tweet using the handle at gbnews, where tonight's poll is too. The results and much, much more coming your way very shortly after this break. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria De Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. 
Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farrow. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee. But we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. I'm loving this. Now it's time for The Clash. OK, so amid mounting pressure and rumblings of a Tory rebellion, Liz Truss is reportedly working on plans to scrap further parts of the mini-budget, with a backtrack on corporation tax... I know, me too, but anyway, looking increasingly likely. So Number 10 insisted this morning that its position has not changed, ruling out a U-turn, but reports suggested there are now active conversations about which measures could be dropped in a bid to stabilise the market. So, Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng, who's currently at an International Monetary Fund summit in Washington, D.C., if you're in trouble, get out of the country, that's right, Kwasi, refused to comment when asked about the swirling rumours today. Our position hasn't changed. I will come up uh, with the uh, medium-term fiscal plan on the 31st of October, as I uh, said earlier in the week, uh, and there'll be more detail there. Is it even a possibility that you're going to U-turn on the corporation? My tax total focus, Faisal is on delivering on the mini-budget and, in making, full, sure, in and making sure that we get growth back into our economy. That's the central prize. That's the main focus. Don't worry, people, I promise you, we're about to liven this up, cos Kwarteng has seemingly rode back on those comments already. The Chancellor tonight told The Telegraph, let's see, when asked about an imminent U-turn on his plan to cut corporation Tax. And it's been another week of intense scrutiny for Liz Trust. Two backbenchers saying a performance at last night's 1922 committee fell flat. One MP told the Daily Mail it was like someone trying to light a fire using a magnifying glass using damp wood in the dark. So basically the opposite of Bear grills. Anyway, unless her own MPs stop undermining her, though, and actually unite for the sake of the party and the country, I'm telling you right now, a nightmare. Don't listen to what you said about no coalition. A nightmare. Sama Sturgeon coalition from hell would be inevitable. We can wave goodbye to Scotland. Some people might say, OK, good, but I'd like that to be on our own terms, frankly. But is this uninspiring choice of a U-turning Tory party or a socialist Labour making you lose faith in British politics? How many people out there right now are politically homeless? How many of you are thinking, I just can't be bothered to vote, frankly? It's like being asked which wet weekend in Skegness I would rather choose. No offence to anyone in Skegness or indeed rain lovers. Let me know your thoughts by emailing Dan, who isn't here, Dan, at gbnews.uk or tweet me at gbnews. And while you're there, go and vote in our poll as well. Why not? I'll bring you those results very, very shortly. But to debate this now, I am joined by TV presenter and actress Jenny Barnett, Conservative commentator Alex Dean and director of the climate analysis group Car26. It's Lois Perry. Alex, I'll start with you because, of course, you are the opposite of whatever... Oh, thorn between two roses. There it is. That was quick. Anyway, um, Alex, look, people are politically homeless. I said it to Mark Stein earlier. I'll say it again. Being asked to choose at the minute between Liz Truss and Keir Starmer... It's like being asked to choose which poo smells nicer. Well, I don't agree with the premise or the way you put it. I would vote for Liz Truss each time out of those things. And actually, I feel the reverse of you. I feel like this is an exciting time in politics. And if anything, oh. it's a time when people should feel more enlivened towards it. This is a time when people should join political parties. Look what's been going on recently with the ability to affect leadership, choose leaders, decide platforms. This is the time to join a party. I feel more enlivened about politics in this country than ever. Good spin. Good spin. Jenny, I'll throw it over to you, TV presenter and actress Jenny Barnett. Every single time I go out on the streets, which I dare say is a lot more than a lot of our politicians, I hear the same thing. I'm politically homeless at the minute. I'm worried about that. I think 
people are not losing faith in politics, they're losing faith in politicians. They are self-serving, they lie, they're corrupt. And if people are confused and they don't know where to turn because of fake news or because they've got misleading information, they don't know what's going on. And politics is life. We vote representatives to be up there to speak on our behalf. Um, I, you may shake your head, but what's happening is that people are tired and fatigued by a shambles of what's going on. What's happened with this last mini budget thing, they don't know what they're blooming talking about. And we have to sit there and have to watch them make mistakes on our behalf. So it's losing faith well, in politicians, not losing faith, faith in politics. OK, well, uh, you might people might disagree with whatever Liz Truss or the mini budget, and they might be you turning on it left, right and centre, but at least they told us for a bit anyway what they thought about something. Lois Perry, who is director of the climate analysis group Car26, Keir Starmer, He's still in no danger whatsoever as telling us what he thinks about anything. Well, I mean, you know, I agree with both of your commentators, actually, because how could anyone not be losing faith in politics and politicians at the moment? You know, with the infighting that's going on in the Tory party, you seem to have a left wing of her party, which is slightly left of uh, Frederick Engels and Karl Marx, who won't give any support to Liz Truss whatsoever. I mean, you've got the globalists under Rishi Sunak who just want to see her finished under any circumstances. You know, it's absolutely disgusting. G give the woman a chance. As it stands, right now, tonight, I support Liz Truss and I'm willing to give her a chance, which is more than most people in her party seem to be. But you know what? Any more U-turns, she must not be wow. returning. She's finished. She well, needs to stay strong now. This and is it. Uh, Alex, now, people have put a lot of faith in this Conservative Party, especially over the time of the pandemic, because people were willing to admit it was chaos. I've obviously been critical about the exact way that we did various things there. But actually, now, the way I'm looking at it, one thing that really winds me up is... I don't know if you ever played any Sunday League football, Alex, or maybe you're more of a rugby man yourself, but you'll have a captain on that team. And sometimes your captain goes through a little bit of poor form, a little bit of good form. But the worst thing you can do as a team is start slating them in public and undermining the dressing room. Yeah. And now I'm hearing noises coming out of the Conservative Party saying, oh, maybe let Labour have a go for a bit. <laughs> it's ridiculous, Alex. Well, that, that's definitely for the birds. But I couldn't agree more with what's been said about giving a new prime minister a chance. Liz Truss has been in office for 40 days. I mean, it, it's absurd to say we should tear down uh, another leader. And uh, that does produce a recipe for chaos. I think that most people in this country, outside of the political bubble, actually believe in giving someone a fair go. I think they believe in giving someone a bit of space to define their time. And I think if you poll people in the country, whichever party they are, and you frame it in the terms of, you know, should you give someone an opportunity to get on with their job or, should, you know, or are these attacks warranted? Most people in Britain would say, give someone who's new in post a chance. And that's all this trust is asking for right now. And I think she's entitled to it. Yeah, I, I agree. Jenny, I'll, I'll bring you back in because, look, you know, I've got to do a job here and, yeah, all right, Liz Truss hasn't got off to the best start and we can't deny that. However, she was given no chance by a load of people in the media when Kwasi did this thing, which was a little bit different. Oh, we've, we've crashed the economy. We've shattered the economy. It's disaster. They're addicted to disaster, Jenny. She's been in politics and government for years and years. And if you look at the Peters principle, which is what's happening here, she has risen to the level of her own incompetence. And that's what's happening. We have a government, we okay. have a government who don't know what they're doing. She smiles, she wears a hat, she wanders around, but she's self-serving. She doesn't give a tuppence about us. OK, all right, Lois. Lois yeah. Perry here, who is director of the climate analysis group Car26. I'll tell you what I think would be a pretty quick vote winner, despite what you might hear in a lot of the media, mm. which is the person who biffs off this net zero agenda and starts fracking and starts putting money in local communities' pockets. Well, absolutely. And this just shows how out of touch a lot of the Tories that are trying to undermine this trust actually are. I mean, our polling that we did when she was doing the leadership contest showed that 70% of Conservative voters actually wanted at least a pause, if not a scrap of mm -hmm. net zero policies. So Conservative yeah. voters don't want net zero. 52% of all voters 
don't want net zero. And if you looked at all the hustings that she did throughout her whole leadership campaign, whenever fracking was mentioned, because that's our energy independence, the biggest cheer went up. So I totally agree with you. If she, she, she must not listen to any of the naysayers in her party. She needs to get fracking. She needs to get rid of all the local legislation in terms of planning and stuff like that so it can be easily overturned. And maybe, maybe even look at a net zero referendum. Oh, Who knows? Good. Good, I like that. The net zero lot can frack right off as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Alex, isn't this Alex Dean now? Isn't the solution staring her right in the face? Be a conservative, sort out immigration, put money in people's pockets, and get out of people's lives as much as you possibly can. Just be a conservative. Well, I certainly agree that immigration is a bright line test for this government and it can't go on not delivering on stopping small boats coming from uh, the North French coast, a safe country, by the way, because the electorate will hold them to account. But the one thing she does have, uh, as long as people don't uh, tear her down precipitately, is that we've got two years until a general election and she can prove herself or not. And then the people can have their say in a general election. And I think that's a reasonable test. But on the broader point, I would just gently make the point that the mini budget, so-called, that Quasi Kwarteng held handed down was profoundly conservative. That was the government aiming True. for a smaller state. That but was no the government trying to lower taxes and get out of people's lives. It's, it, Alex, that's a really good point. And that brings me on to this, Jenny, because unfortunately the establishment was there. The establishment reared its head. Oh, we can't possibly have something different. We can't possibly have something that goes against the status quo. What happens? We crash the pound. We're being told it's going to be all doom mongery. We're being told we're all going to be poor. And now we've got U turns back to the same old status quo and what we were skint before, and it will make us more skint again instead of going for growth and backing Britain, Jenny. I think that that. Weirdly, is an irrelevance. We have a, oh. we have a, listen. We have a world that's dying. We have ninety-four percent of our wildlife dying. We have the Amazon dying. We have bees dying. And you're talking about who's got the best job in the world, in our country, when the world is dying. And if you talk about zero this and zero that and fracking. We well, won't people will be dying if they can't afford to heat their homes or buy food. That needs to be the priority, we people, actually. We won't have a world that we can argue about nonsense. if we don't... Absolute what, 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 nonsense. Oh, well, I don't think it's nonsense. Yeah, well, it is. <clears throat> right, well, I'll give the final word to Alex then. Um, Alex, do you think there's any chance whatsoever that Liz Truss can actually rescue this? Because, you know, it's not looking too good at the minute, bless her. The Conservative Party has long shown that in the absence of a meaningful opposition, it will create one for itself. And that's what we've been going <laughs> yeah. through of late. Right? But I don't, still don't think the electorate, when faced with the choice, will prefer Keir Starmer and a really, with his polite face on it, socialist platform. In the end, I believe that Liz Cross can deliver another Conservative majority. OK, OK, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to do very quick fire, Jenny. We're going to do very quick fire, OK? Very, yes, I know. Very quick fire. It's a yes or no. Jenny, I'll start with you and I'll work my way down the line, OK? Yes or no, will Liz Truss be in charge leading the Tories into the next general election? Jenny? No. Alex? Yes. Oh, there we go, the decider, Lois. Yes, but no more U-turns. The lady must not be for turning again. All three of you, I've absolutely loved that. Thank you very much. That Thanks was so TV much. presenter and actress Jenny Barnett, Conservative commentator Alex Dean and director of the Climate Analysis Group, Car26, Lois Perry. Brilliant stuff. Oh, there we go. We're away now, people. So, who do you agree with? Are you turning Tories and socialist Labour making you lose faith in politics? Lots of people are sick and tired of this. And you know what? I think the polls, some of them. They can do what I mean. The polls weren't right when Trump smashed the living heck out of Hillary Clinton. Whether the polls weren't right when Brexit actually won. Why should the polls necessarily be right now? And you know, have you ever met anyone who's taken part in a poll? By the way, I haven't. There we go. Anyway, Sean said on Twitter, "It's more of the party politics that the general public are losing faith in now. I don't trust any party anymore." Sean, a, a cracking view. And this is it. At the last election, I'm telling you, there were loads of people who voted and they voted for Boris and they never voted before necessarily and they went out and voted for him because they thought, I quite like the cut of his jib. Now, Boris has gone. I'm sorry, Liz Truss, 
Kissed armor. It's like going carpet shopping on a weekend, isn't it? Andy said on Twitter, politics is only spoiled by all the politicians with the egos the size of Africa. Who pays for their mistakes? Oh, yeah, every single one of us. Thank you very much. There's loads more emails, but I haven't got time to them. I believe have we, have we got a poll? We've got a poll. We've got a verdict on our poll. Yes, lots of you have been getting in touch on that. 89% of you, 89% of you said that you are losing faith in politics. You're politically homeless. Some would argue that there might be space there for a new political party. Anyone seen Nigel Farage? Well, 11% of you say that you're still holding hope. Right, coming up. Is the government's plan to send asylum seekers to Rwanda within just three weeks of a glimmer of hope for the silent majority who've been ignored over their illegal immigration fears? It was on this show, by the way, when I was covering for Dan another time. We had Rwanda plane takeoff watch. We had a camera through a fence looking at that flight on the runway. We were ready to rock and roll, people. We were ready to see it take off to Rwanda. Then the lights go off, the airport shuts down, security go home, and it turns out it's been grounded. And just like a flight that's been booked with Ryanair, it still hasn't taken off now or reached its destination. Fleet Street legend Calvin McKenzie sounds off on the outsider at 9.50. But first, is the government's plan to send those asylum seekers to Rwanda within just weeks away? Yes, we'll go to that. That is, like I've said, at 9.50. We are going to be discussing as well Sir David Amos, aren't we? Who is, uh, unfortunately, we're coming up to the one-year anniversary of his death. Anne Widdicombe is going to be joining us for that. Do you think that all this infighting is a disservice to Sir David's wonderful legacy? And what's happened to Islamist terror? Because that seems to be off the agenda. It's Patrick Christie here, covering for the wonderful Dan Watson on Dan Watson tonight. No spin, no bias, no censorship, just me. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria De Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness, me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Welcome back, everybody. This is Patrick Christie standing in for Dan Wotton. Well, Kelvin McKenzie will join me very, very shortly. A first look at tomorrow's front pages are also coming up, so we'll keep you well informed. But first, a story that I think is close to all of our hearts for a variety of different reasons. Saturday will sadly mark the first anniversary of the murder of Sir David Amos, who was brutally stabbed during one of his regular surgeries, just doing his job just doing his duty in the South End West constituency. Ahead of this sombre occasion, Speaker of the House, Sir Lindsay Hoyle, gave a poignant tribute to the remarkable public servant. This Saturday marks the first anniversary of the death of our friend and colleague, Sir David Amos, 
who was murdered in his South End West constituency. David was an extremely diligent constituency member of Parliament and he died carrying out his democratic duties. That made his death all the more shocking. May I express on behalf of the whole House our sympathy with his family, friends and colleagues on this sad anniversary. David was a long-serving member, respected and liked on all sides of the House. We will not forget him. Yeah. Well, we certainly won't, and we certainly won't here at GB News. Among other remembering David Amos' remarkable legacy is one of his closest friends. His former Tory minister is Anne Widdicombe, who provided vital support to his family during the trial of radical Islamist Ali Harbi Ali that thankfully saw justice served, although, frankly, not necessarily in exactly the way I would have liked it served. But as we approach the tragic milestone, Anne has raised concerns that the current Tory infighting and betrayal of Conservative policies is, in fact, doing a disservice to the memory of a party grandee. Anne joins me now to pay tribute to David and talk about a lot of the wider issues, really, at play here. And there are rather a lot of issues for us to get stuck into, Anne. Firstly, thank you very much. Let's start, I think, the proper way and the right way by saying, goodness gracious me, has it been a year already? And just expressing some condolences, really, for the passing of Sir David. It probably, to you, still doesn't quite feel real. Why do you think that the current state of party politics is doing him a disservice? Oh, I think it's doing him a mammoth disservice. David was extremely loyal. He had uh, enormous respect uh, for the party. Uh, he always tried to support the administration, like all of us, from time to time. Uh, he found it necessary to vote against, but he always agonised very deeply before he did it. Uh, and he would often say to me, you know, what is... I mean, this was, you know, a few years ago, he would say to me, what is the matter with everybody? Don't they understand uh, that if we don't support uh, ministers, all we're going to end up with is the opposition? And then he had some choice words to say about Labour, because uh, he always did, despite the fact that he was so friendly with a lot of Labour MPs. Uh, and uh, I can hear him saying it, and I can hear the despair in his voice. Mm. And now it has reached proportions that not even in his worst nightmares would he have foreseen. Well, the thing is, conservative values and conservative principles, and yes, there are a lot of them, but one of them is strong borders. And, and I absolutely could not get my head around where we currently are with this. We've got a high court case as to whether or not we're allowed to deport people who, in my opinion, a lot of them come here illegally. We don't appear to be sending anyone back to Albania, which is... By the same metric that people use the Rwanda issue, either a safer country or, or, or just a slightly worse country, they can't be able to make their minds up there. And then we've got Liz Truss potentially wanting more legal immigration to go for growth, but then she doesn't really want to go for growth. It's a bit of a mess, and I'm worried that if we don't sort out immigration, then, frankly, that is one of the reasons why Sir David Amos's legacy will, will, will go unremembered. Indeed, there is an enormous difference between legal and illegal immigration. And the whole point of Brexit was that we could control our borders. So we could say how many people came in, what qualifications they had to have, the terms on which mm. they could come here, how long they could stay. Uh, so if we had skill shortages, uh, okay. we could recruit the right people. All right. That was the argument. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. And sorry, I hope you don't mind this. There's just a slight issue with you, Mike, which we're going to get sorted. So I'm going to fill to my heart's content for a second while we sort that out. But just on this note, people, we're going to be talking about this a little bit later on, right? It's the Rwanda stuff. It's in the High Court at the minute. There are all these worthy, lefty, lovey charities saying that we shouldn't be sending people over to Rwanda because it's against their human rights. We can't possibly process asylum claims in three weeks. I'm not sure about you, but I think it should be quite easy to prove whether or not you actually need asylum, whether or not you are an asylum seeker. One way you could do it is to maybe keep your passport and not ditch it in the channel and actually come over here potentially through a legal route. What do you think about that? We will be giving you the very latest on the Rwandan court case as to whether or not we're actually going to be sending people over there. The other element of this David Amos stuff, which I am not going to drop here on GB News, is fighting Islamist extremism. With all this cost of living stuff that's gone on, everything going on in Russia, everything going on in the channel, all of these things that are taking place, the chaos in Downing Street, the chaos on the opposition benches, yeah, all of that, it's all gone very quiet about Islamist terrorism, hasn't it? We will not be dropping that right here on GB News. Unfortunately, we're not able to get Ant back, but there'll always be a next time. Coming up, 
is a reported plot to overthrow the Prime Minister with an alliance of Rishi Sunak and Penny Morden. Really the answer to our country's problems? Sounds a bit like a coup, if you ask me. Is Liz Truss in charge really that bad in the grand scheme of things? Look, what, what, what could be happening? We could have Joe Biden, for example. The Germans put up with Angela Merkel for absolutely yonks. The French, they've got Macron. I think he's just a bit weird. My superstar panel will return to debate that in the media buzz. That is at 10. But first, after 856 migrants crossed the channel on Wednesday, and by the way, comparatively, that's quite a good day, is the government's plan to send asylum seekers to Rwanda in just three weeks a glimmer of hope that the crisis will actually be solved? Don't hold your breath, people. Fleet Street legend Calvin McKenzie is tonight's outsider. Loads to get stuck into with that, by the way. Not only, apparently, are these flights still being delayed, we will have to wait and see as to whether or not any of them take off. There's record numbers coming across in the channel and these migrant hotels are probably in a town or village or city wherever you are and you may well have had enough of it. Yeah, well actually children, predictably children, have started going missing from these hotels. I managed to walk myself, unopposed I may add, into one of these hotels, walk around it and walk back out of it again. If I'd have had bad intentions I could have done whatever I like. Kevin McKenzie tonight's outsider is after the break. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria De Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie's. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12pm. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Yeah, welcome back, everybody. OK, people, we've managed to resuscitate this because Anne Widdicombe is back. Joining us now, Anne, very sorry about that. It sounded it sound like you're underwater, I'm afraid, Anne. But you're back. You were, you were paying tribute to Sir David yeah. Amos. One of the things that I think the best way to honour his legacy would be to get to grips when it comes to sorting out Islamist terrorism in this country. Aren't we doing enough with that, do you think, Anne? One's got to apply some common sense here. Politicians have to mix with the public. They have to guide into their constituencies. They can't possibly be watched every minute of the day. And therefore, there's always going to be an element of risk. But I think there are certain sensible things that we could do um, that uh, some have done, but not necessarily all, uh, which is that we can introduce safety features into constituency surgeries, um, make sure we know the names and addresses of people who are coming, make sure they actually are constituents, and always, always, I would say, uh, have um, another man present. Always uh, have someone present. Rather than, as happened with David, there All were right. two women on duty. 
Look, I agree with you, Anne. Very sorry that I'm uh, very sorry that we had to get you off and then bring you back on. But there we go. Anne Whittacombe there. Thank you very much. And I hope to speak to you again very soon. And take care. Right now, we've got coming up anyway. Very shortly, a first look at tomorrow's front pages today. I've got some of them here. Some of them have just dropped. You're not going to want to miss these. The Daily Star's a bit tasty. But for now, we've got the Outsider. <laughs> Right, well, the number of migrants to arrive in the UK since records began, apparently, has topped 75,000, with a whopping 856 migrants crossing yesterday alone. And believe it or not, that was quite a good day. As figures continue to soar, vocal critics of illegal immigration, like my next guest, Fleet Street legend Calvin McKenzie, feel their voices are being ignored. And I dare say, so are yours as well. Not a word from trust, Calvin tweeted. Not a peep from Suella. And Labour took their traditional view that they welcomed them as they would be voting their way one day. Absolutely true. It's all tactical. Kelvin McKenzie, I believe, joins me now. Kelvin, can I just say, first and foremost, apologies for using that picture. You look much better now. Well, this is the advantage of uh, less alcohol and more tennis. But... Um, uh, look, Kelvin, just on this... just, just less just... alcohol... Yeah, well, yes, it's uh, But just on this, Calvin, just on this now, I'm sick and tired of people who are against what's going on in the channel being called racist for saying that it's a poor expenditure of public money and for being concerned that the demographics of their town, village or city might change. You are indeed the not-so-silent majority for being worried about this, aren't you? Right, but there's some fantastic stuff. I don't know whether you've seen what's breaking tonight. Unbelievably, some BBC reporters, right, which you find hard to believe, but they do employ them, um, uh, uh, posed as migrants and discovered that the French lay on free bus service from the camps outside Dunkirk, which then ferries the migrants in, who then hide in the dunes, although everybody knows where they are, waiting for the boats to turn up, and then they head our way. So it's not as though the French... Macron and his mates no. don't know what's going on. There are actual free buses, presumably funded by the French taxpayer, who are actually bringing these people uh, uh, to, to oh, Dunkirk and to the dunes and then going over. And yeah. what this proves conclusively is that despite us sending 50, 60 million a year to them or whatever yeah. we're sending to them, they are in some kind of conspiracy with the migrants in order to help them get out of France and into the UK. A, because it helps their own position, and I of do understand that, but also it actually causes us a problem which cheers them up as well. Do yeah. you realise, I just did a bit of research before I came on tonight, there are now 36,000 that have come over this year. The towns, that's bigger than the towns of Boston in Lincolnshire, yep. um, bigger, bigger than Braintree in Essex, and what about this one? Bigger than Canterbury. We, yeah. are, we are developing huge towns. We can't yeah. cope, as and trust then... proves conclusively. We can't cope. We haven't got enough money even to have enough GPs or nurses or get the holes in our roads filled. No. So what on earth are we going to do with 36,000 people costing us well... millions a day in hotels? Where is this money coming from? And why is it that Trust feels that she doesn't need to say anything about this? What she does say well, about Kelvin, is finances. And what's Kelvin, the effect asking, of that? It's driven up our mortgages. Kelvin, she would get elected as Prime Minister again in 2024 if she says, I've got a solution and I've proved it. But we've got a solution, Kelvin, 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 Kelvin. We've got a solution. We're just not allowed to do it. Part of that solution is getting those flights on the tarmac, on the runway and off to Rwanda. But unfortunately, all these lefty charities and lawyers or whatever are coining it off the top by sending us to court and saying that we can't do this because it's absolutely unfair, right? So, basically, the government obviously wants to see these asylum seekers who are coming across the channel go to Rwanda... Do you think they actually will be taking off at any point? Because we've already lobbed the Rwandans about I 150 do. million. I, do. I, I, I think the government will win this case. They won before, mm. but they, but they, but uh, the the other side demanded a, 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 a more extensive trial. Effectively, I th I think we are going to win it. Even if we win it, though, Patrick, 
we're talking about a couple of hundred people. I, how on earth are we supposed to move 36,000 people who have no intention whatsoever of leaving our shores? Why should they? They're living rent free, food, the food's paid of course. for. Everything is fine. Well, it's, it's a better, better I'm sorry, it's a better setup. It's a it's a better setup than any student in this country right now. They're not coming out of it with twenty odd grand's worth of debt. They're not having to pay for their own food. And you know what as well? You've got residents, poor residents, sitting there who've got, got a, 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 a hotel full of these migrants who have got nothing to do all day, by the way. So they're just hanging around and well, sometimes they're not allowed they're to work, are they? Well they're not allowed to well they're not allowed to work, but there's also nothing for them to do. So they're just hanging around. And then you get poor old Marjorie from Maidenhead who pipes up and says, actually, to be honest with you, I'm I, I don't feel quite as safe as I used to walking home from Aldi. Now Marjorie's a racist, Kelvin. I mean, it's news to me. It's absolutely unbelievable. Very quickly, Kelvin, though, very, very quickly, because I am getting shouted out currently, right? Children have now started going missing, predictably. Children, young children, have started going missing from these migrant hotels. If it wasn't just going to be the illegality of it that was going to turn these lefties off, if it wasn't just going to be the fact that it's immense cost to the taxpayer, what about the fact that, in my opinion, this right now is some kind of criminal paedophile paradise, frankly, where you can walk in and take your pick? Yes, I mean, it, it, is, it is shocking. I mean, I saw a number that said that 1,600 unaccompanied children had so far this year come over. Nobody, why are they doing this? It's utterly cynical. They're putting these kids on there, right? They have no identity and they say, you're on your own. Why would they do that except unless they were going to exploit them later? Kelvin, good point to finish on, although it's a depressing point, but it's very succinct. Thank you very much. Kelvin McKenzie there, absolute legend. And someone who, there's a reason why when Kelvin McKenzie was in charge of a newspaper. It was the UK's largest ever selling newspaper because it was the not so silent majority. It's about time somebody spoke up for them again. Kelvin McKenzie there, the former editor of The Sun. Right, it's just gone 10 pm. This is Dan Woodson tonight with me, Patrick Christie's. Now, tonight, there's more discontent from the Tory party amid rumblings of further U-turns on the mini-budget from Liz Truss. But would a reported plot to overthrow the Prime Minister with an alliance of Rishi Sunak and Penny Morden really be the answer? Probably not. Is having Truss in power that bad in the grand scheme of things? Look across the pond. We could have Joe B B B Biden, couldn't we? That's the question I'm going to be posing next to my superstar panel of Conservative commentator. We've got Albie... Amon Kona, we've got former Tory London mayoral candidate Sean Bailey and author and journalist Amy Nakao. And as former Health Secretary Sajid Javid makes this shocking admission. Would I have done it any differently you know, looking back at now? No, absolutely not. It wouldn't change anything. The country and the health service is absolutely knackered because of what we did because of COVID. Anyway, I'll bottle it up and I'll let it all out later. Should the government apologise, reimburse and reinstate the tens of thousands of care workers it ridiculously forced out of work because of these vaccine mandates, especially when it turned out that Pfizer didn't even bother to check whether or not their vaccine stopped transmission? Professor of Evidence-Based Medicine, that's rare, isn't it? Evidence-Based Medicine at the University of Oxford, Carl Hannigan, is leading the charge for justice alongside the Together Declaration. He joins me at 10.20. As a new report finds a culture of fear is preventing the expression of free speech in UK universities, is the next generation doomed if they refuse to let their views be challenged? They've got no spine that lot. Social media sensation Zuby has been speaking out against this epidemic of what he calls, anyway, Intellectual unfitness. It's going to be really insightful, that, people. Make sure you stay locked in, because that's at 10.40, and that is on cancel. Plus, after the home of the European Parliament attempts to cancel Jesus and limits the sale of crucifixes at the Christmas market, you can't cancel Jesus, he's the Son of God. Is wokeism determined to kill off Christianity? We'll have that and a first look at tomorrow's front pages. Today in the media buzz, all of that's at 10.30. Plus, did King Charles really distrust? We'll discuss as I crown the final Greatest Britain and Union Jackass of the Week. But without further dither and delay, better late than never, Polly, it's your news. Patrick, thank you. Good evening. The Chancellor's insisting the government's position on the economy has not changed. 
That's ahead of the Bank of England's support measures coming to an end tomorrow. Kwasi Kwarteng says his focus is now on delivering the mini-budget amid reports of a government U-turn on the plan. The Prime Minister has been urged to reconsider the measures by some Tory members of the 1922 committee, leading to some speculation that Liz Truss's own position could be in jeopardy. International Trade Secretary Kemi Badenoch says it's important the party now works together. Even talking about changing uh, leaders at this time would be disastrous. We should not be talking about that at all. We should be focusing on what is important for people's lives, uh, for their jobs uh, and for their prosperity. It's time to unite and get behind the Prime Minister and focus on her growth agenda. Well, away from politics, a court has been hearing today how a nurse accused of murdering several babies wrote notes to herself which said, I am evil and I killed them on purpose. The notes were found during a search of her home. Lucy Letby is charged with the murder of seven babies and the attempted murder of ten others at the Countess of Chester Hospital from 2015 to 2016. Her defence counsel telling Manchester Crown Court today she cared deeply about the babies and loved her job. 32-year-old Letby denies all the allegations. International news and in Ukraine, the newly installed Russian governor of Kherson has appealed to residents to evacuate the city amid advancing Ukrainian forces. Kherson is one of four partially occupied regions Russia claims to have annexed following President Putin's so-called referenda. Vladimir Saldo has publicly asked for the Kremlin's help to send civilians to so-called safer parts of Russia. It's one of the starkest signs yet that Moscow is losing its grip on the Ukrainian territory it claims to have taken over. Meanwhile, Ukrainian government's urging citizens to prepare for more electrical blackouts. People are being asked to stock up on warm clothes, candles, batteries and cut down their electricity use as much as possible. In the United States, a jury is recommending a life sentence for a gunman who killed 17 people at a school in Florida four years ago. Nicolas Cruz, who was 19 at the time, used a semi-automatic weapon at Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland. He pleaded guilty to the murder of 14 of his fellow students and 13 members of staff. Here, the government has said is they've unlocked £100 million worth of export markets within the alcohol industry. The International Trade Department says it's intervened to end a number of barriers, including with several African and South American nations, such as in Argentina, where whisky tariffs were reduced from 35% to 20% following talks. And lastly, the Queen Consort has carried out her first solo engagement in her capacity with her new royal title. Camilla met with victims of domestic abuse at the Chelsea Westminster Hospital in London. She also spoke with professionals in the field and other staff as well. A worker for the charity Safe Live said Camilla was doing a wonderful job. That's it. You're up to date on TV, online and on DAB Plus Radio. You're with GB News, the People's Channel, where now it's time for part two of Dan Wooden Tonight with Patrick Christus. Welcome back. Tomorrow News Tonight now in our media buzz. OK, let's kick off with the very first look at the front pages hot off the press. And the eye is leading on the claims that PM Liz Truss is planning a tax cut U-turn whilst the Chancellor is out of the country. Oh, I'll never notice that one. More on that in a mo. Now, the Daily Star takes yet another comical take on proceedings by asking which wet lettuce will last longer as Liz Truss faces fresh pressure over the tax fiasco. The Metro now, they lead on the trial of nurse Lucy Letby. And this is shocking stuff, people. Who is accused of murdering seven newborn babies at a neonatal unit. In court today, the jury heard details of handwritten notes written by Letby that were uncovered by detectives. One read, I'm evil, I did this. She denies the charges and, of course, the trial continues. My superstar panel are back with me. Former Conservative London mayoral candidate Sean Bailey, author and broadcaster Amy Nicole, and political commentator and co-founder of Conservatives Against Racism, 
Ah, it's the wonderful Albie Amancona. Thank you very much, all three of you. Right, now, Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng has insisted he and Prime Minister Liz Truss won't resign, despite reports of another major U-turn on his mini-budget. I believe we can have a look at this now. It is a very uh, a dicey situation globally. Everybody uh, is focused on inflation. Everybody is affected by uh, potential interest rate rises. Everybody is affected by the energy uh, price spikes. And you'll be Chancellor and Liz Truss will be Prime Minister this time next month? Absolutely, 100%. I'm not going anywhere. OK, so his comments came after Foreign Secretary James Cleverley defended the government's growth plan and lambasted the idea of replacing Liz Truss. She made the point that uh, we had to reduce the tax burden for both families uh, and businesses down from a 70-year high. It's, I think that changing the leadership would be a disastrously bad idea, not just uh, politically but also economically. Um, and we are absolutely going to stay focused on growing the economy. Well, he's spot on. She's seven weeks in the job, for goodness sake. The country needs a bit of stability, and with Labour storming ahead in the polls now amid rumours of a fishy, rishy and mordant coup in the offing, shouldn't we be careful what we wish for? I said this, and I got, I got lambasted for this on Twitter. I said, shouldn't Tories be careful what they wish for getting rid of Boris Johnson? Uh, yes, absolutely, because here we are. The grass isn't always greener in politics, people, and we shouldn't allow ourselves to be governed by the will of the political media and the establishment. Just look across the pond. Sleepy Joe Biden's gaff-ridden presidency was the MSM's liberal answer to Trump. But that hasn't exactly gone to plan. Has it? If you ask Joe Biden right now what day of the week it is, he wouldn't be able to tell you. He's the same old, stale, uninspiring politician with the added downside of potentially not being entirely in possession of his faculties. And is, I mean, I mean, it's just absolutely bonkers. He does look a bit to me like a very old family pet that needs to be taken on one last trip to the vets. But as the Donald, the leader of the free world, ladies and gentlemen, as the Donald hilariously demonstrated at a recent rally. Just a little quick video made up. Would you like to see it? Yeah. How would you say your mental focus is? Well, it's focused. <laughs> I, say it's, I think it's, I, I haven't, look. Let's get ready to bumble! I think it's a right for people that have bad and kept care. True and it acts up to pressure. <laughs> God, I said, oh my Lord, I can't believe I said that. America is a nation that can be defined in a single word. Y'all ready for this? Oh, uh, no one does it like Trump. I'm sorry, nobody does it quite like Trump. That is, I was, sleepy Joe, sleepy Joe. Anyway, so, <laughs> should we be grateful for Liz Truss as Prime Minister and rail against attempts to overthrow her, given the alternative? Sean Bailey joins me now. I will start with you, Sean. Oh, we should be careful what we wish for, shouldn't we? Let's just be very clear. To remove the Prime Minister now would be a monumental act of self-harm. <laughs> Divided parties lose elections. That is a fact. I don't even know if you could do it under current Tory rules mm. anyway, but more importantly, Tory MPs have got to have some spine. Half the reason the PM is having these troubles is because they won't row to her defence. Now, she's made one U-turn, she shouldn't make any more, and they should provide her with a platform to stand strong. Continually attacking her means she's much more likely to make a U-turn. And the idea that you can re replace her with, with Rishi and Morden is craziness. They both lost in the first election. All this would do is confirm to members that they're much more about their careers than they yeah. are about the will of the country and the, the, the state of the country. Amy, should we not have a leader who actually has a little bit of conviction in what they say. I mean, at the moment, we've got politicians who say one thing, and then if the banks react badly and the media reacts badly, they just do what they say anyway. Beth Rugby might be running the country. I think Liz Truss is so bad that she may as well be a Labour plant at this point, because she has done the Labour Party the world of favours. Um, you said divided parties don't win elections. That is where you've lost the next election. Well, to, well, to be honest with you, though, although, you know, I hope not, I think there's some truth in that. Unless something changes in the Tory party at the minute, uh, unfortunately, I don't see how they win. Oh, we should we be careful what we wish for? Because, all right, Starmer, well, whilst I don't necessarily agree with him, I, I think he, I don't think he's senile, right? So we can't really compare him directly to somebody else over the pond there. But should we be careful what we wish for if we're thinking about getting rid of trust? 
Look, I think it would be electoral suicide to be getting rid of Liz Truss at the moment. Look, personally, I didn't vote for Liz Truss in the leadership election, but I think it's important that we get behind the Prime Minister. She's very new in the job. She's already performed a U-turn, which obviously isn't that helpful. I don't think she should be performing another one. I think of all the tax cuts that she had in her plans, I think the corporation tax not going up to 24% actually probably made the most sense. So I think going back on that, as, as we're hearing in the, in the press, would probably not be the best idea. Um, and I think now is the time for us to get behind Liz Truss mm. as the leader. And, and MPs shouldn't be trying to get rid of her. Mm. Perhaps they should be trying to influence her policy a little bit more. OK, I'll work my way back down the line, actually, Amy. Uh, I'm concerned for Liz Truss because, as we've seen, the media in America got Joe Biden elected. It wasn't himself. The media in America have kept him in a job because, for the love of God, he shouldn't be there, in fact, for his own good. <laughs> now the media in this country have turned against Truss in a big way. Is it just game over for her? But it's not just the media, is it? It's, it's an opinion shared by the markets, the opinion polls. There's a lot of evidence behind the reason why she's tanking, because she tanked the pound. People are paying £500 for their mortgage a month. This isn't just an opinion anymore. This is a backed-up fact that she's not doing a good job and something needs to change. Sean, why should anyone bother going into politics these days? From where I'm sitting, it looks absolutely horrendous. There, there are a lot of jobs you can get a lot more money and have a lot better personal life, a lot better private life, a lot better enjoyment and normality than without having to go into politics and have everything rake through and then find yourself on the front page of The Guardian or, indeed, The Daily Star next to a picture of a lettuce. <laughs> Look... Let's establish some facts here. The market's tanked because of what the Bank of England done. It happened again today with what the Bank of England done. Andrew Bailey and some poor decisions he has made, and he's using Liz's trust's problems to cover those up. The real thing here is we need a Prime Minister to give us some stability, and that stability comes from our MPs, and our MPs have to support her. And to, to answer your question yeah. directly, going into politics is far easier if the people that are in your party support you. The one thing we should take from the Labour party is their togetherness. There's lots of people who know Starmer is unelectable, but they simply wouldn't say it. They're supporting him and hoping that he's electable. We as a party have to get behind the PM. Mm -hmm. I actually believe Liz will do a good job if she's not rowing with Conservative MPs. She could she can deal with the Labour Party, but she can't deal with the Labour Party and the Conservative Party. We should back supporting her. Supporting somebody while secretly knowing they're unelectable is what I feel that most of the Conservatives that are still supporting Liz Truss are doing at this not point. Not at all. That, that's the whole point of the Labour Party. You, you all supported Neil Kinnock, you all supported well, it, Corbyn. The whole point is this, I believe she can do the job. I, I did vote for her, by the way. I believe she can do the job not doing as the long job. as the party is behind Give her. Give her a bit of time. I mean, she's only had... She had a point weeks. for every day. How would, you have, liked it? How, would you, how would you have liked it if your first couple of goes on the media, people had written you off, right? They wouldn't have given you the chance to blossom into this beautiful, tremendous media sensation that you are today. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I'll be quick. But, 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 Patrick, we, we cannot, you know, get away from the fact that there have been some really, I think, poor decision-making that has gone on in this government mm. so far. I think the policies on their own in isolation have been good, but the cadence has been wrong. The, the cadence. cadence. The cadence has been wrong. I'll really? be there. Thank you very much. Now, coming up, after the home of the European Parliament attempts to cancel Jesus, that's right, the baby Jesus, and limits the sale of crucifixes at his Christmas market, is wokeism determined to kill off Christianity? I can hardly keep a straight face saying this. My panel will thrash that out in the media buzz at 10.30. But first, should the government apologise, compensate and reinstate the tens of thousands of care workers forced out by vaccine mandates? Without question, Professor of Evidence-Based Medicine at the University of Oxford, Carl Hennigan, is leading the charge for justice alongside the Together Declaration, and he is here next. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria De Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 
Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Okay, well, another look at tomorrow's newspapers front page is coming right up, but it's time now for top epidemiologist Carl Hannigan. Now, do you remember this bombshell admission from Pfizer on Tuesday in the European Parliament? Check this out. Was the Pfizer COVID vaccine tested on stopping the transmission of the virus before it entered the market? Um, regarding the question around, um, did we know about stopping humanisation before um, it entered the market? No. <laughs> She's laughing. I'm not laughing. The only reason I went and got the jab was because I thought, oh, well, maybe I won't give it on to other people now. It wasn't really for my own personal safety. I didn't care. I had COVID early doors. It bounced off me. I'm young, relatively fit and healthy. And I wasn't particularly bothered about it. It was so that I didn't go around killing old people. Well, it turns out that Pfizer had no idea whether or not that would be true. Well, former Health Secretary Sajid Javid has now sensationally admitted that he would have done nothing different. Nothing. Not one thing differently when it came to mandating that care home workers to get vaccinated during the pandemic. A move that forced out tens of thousands of care home workers, as if old people didn't have it bad enough. Up to 40,000, according to some estimates, who refused to get the jab. All right, fair enough. Screw you for having principles, apparently. Watch this jaw-dropping exchange with Alan Miller of the Together Declaration yesterday, who are campaigning for a government apology and compensation, quite right, too, for all those poor workers who lost their livelihoods. We've seen that 40,000 people were actually lost in the care sector because we did have a particular policy. And I wonder now, just in reflection, when you look back on things, would you have done it differently in terms of the mandate that was uh, brought in? Would I have done it any differently you know, looking back at now? No, absolutely not. Because when you're a minister, you have to make decisions based on the facts and information you have in front of you at the time. Don't you dare tell me the facts change. The fact is, you never asked for the facts. Javid says that he worked with the facts, but the facts were that Pfizer had no clue about the jab's effects on transmission when it came to the market. And even now, the scientific community is very divided about how much it helped, if at all. Frankly, I'm sick and tired. I don't know about you. I'm sick and tired of hearing about people, oh, I've had my fifth COVID jab. Oh, I've just got COVID. It's really not wind out my sails. Another hard truth, the health secretary's government had very minimal data based off its own studies that justified enforcing such draconian jabs for jobs policy. Unbelievable stuff. Loads to unpack here, like an onion of misery. Carl Hennigan, director of the University of Oxford Centre for Evidence-Based... Say that again. Evidence-Based Medicine. There we are. You've signed this Together Declaration petition. Should the government apologise, reinstate and compensate all those poor care workers, and not just the government, the people like the Chris Whitties of this world and your valances and all of that lot who were there, giving it large, should they be the ones now to say sorry and compensate these poor workers who had to lose their jobs, frankly, as it's turned out, for absolutely nothing? 
Well, look, I'm, one of the other things I am as well is an urgent care general practitioner, and I've gone into care homes throughout this pandemic, and I wanted to first say the people who work in this setting are amazing. Right throughout the COVID pandemic, they put themselves on the line, and often in situations where they have significant outbreaks in their care home. And if you go, what happened is on 11th of November 2021, we turned around and said, if you don't have the vaccine, you don't have a job anymore. So the first thing is you say, well, look, look at all the effort and all the risks they put themselves to that point in time. And I, and I think what's interesting is that you showed Alan Miller there is it was very clear about this issue of transmission very early on. I don't understand what facts you can be looking at if you weren't understanding the major impact of this vaccine with those most at yeah. risk, the very well, elderly, just, just and the impact. In the just to clarify, Carl, sorry, I just want to make one thing very, very clear, right, which is that so what essentially the government and the medical professionals, or at least the bigwigs who were allowed in front of the cameras, were saying was that at the height of this pandemic, when it was unknown and it was frankly absolutely terrifying, care home workers were absolutely A-OK -okay to crack on and work in care homes where people with COVID were being sent, not even from those care homes, into other care homes. They could work, they could watch people die, they could get COVID themselves and bring it back to their families. But when they refuse, for whatever personal choice that may have been, to not get the jab, they were essentially sacked, even though the people who made that jab, in the case of Pfizer, I had no idea whether or not it actually reduced transmission anyway. So one of the key aspects of healthcare is informed consent. You should be able to understand the benefits and harms of treatment. The idea that you put a mandate on people, a legal requirement to have an intervention, is a really serious issue to debate. One of the key things as well is you shouldn't have any alternative strategy at hand. Remember, and you could have been tested on the way in at the door. So you did have alternative strategies. So even ethically, it wouldn't stand up if you looked at it, the idea of a mandate. But you're right. If we look at it now, the numbers, there are 165,000 vacancies in social care. It's the largest number they've ever been. And these people were putting Lovely. themselves on the line, many of them for like minimum wage. And when you yeah. look at it, they can get better wages at the supermarket these days. So the idea that we persecuted them is now looking back and saying, I'm totally in line with what Alan Miller's saying. And I think if we don't reinstate and compensate these people, mm -hmm. we won't bring this back to the important level that being in the care sector is one of the most important jobs we need in the midst of a pandemic. And we need to look after these people who put them on themselves on the line each day. Well, I'm worried about the future president. I'm worried about it because at some point in my lifetime, there'll be something else. I've been hearing about something like this my entire lifetime. It was going to be bird flu. It was going to be swine flu. It was going to be mad cow disease. It was going to be whatever the heck it was, right? And in the end, it was COVID, OK? There'll be something else before the time I'm out of it. Well, then, are we going to do the same thing again? We're just going to make people lose their livelihoods and their livings during an economic crisis, a self-inflicted economic crisis, for goodness sake. Uh, in, you know, in, if, they don't, if they don't pump something into their bodies that they don't want to have. But there's a petition, isn't there, that hopefully people can sign and listen to and get things debated. What is this petition? So the petition there is by the Tomorrow Declaration is 23,000 people have signed that so far. And it sets out this basic premise that we want the government, it's going to go to Theresa Coffey when we've enough people have signed it, to say we want an apology to these workers. You've said about reinstating and compensating them. But I also think this also goes to a wider issue at the end of the day, which you're, you're alluding to. This is an important issue for the inquiry, is you have to stop a few people bringing in laws that actually aren't fought through and we as a democracy have an ability to have input to. And so that's where I think countries like Sweden had a much better legal framework than us with the Coronavirus Act, which meant people could act and within days have these rules, mm. which actually, when you look back, it only lasted four months, this mandate. By 15th of March 2022, it was gone. And it went mm. because they realised on 1st of April it was going to apply to the NHS as well. So once he started to understand it was going to be a bigger problem, then it was repealed. So we have to have mechanisms yeah. to stop a few people at government bringing in laws well, we, that we actually do. the vast majority of us all find irreprehensible we, at the end of the day. We do. And you know what, actually, Carl? I'll hold my hands up here. As a journalist, I felt very bad that it took a Dutch MEP called Rob Roots to ask a question to 
somebody that I think journalists should have been asking for a lot longer, which is just pretty straightforward, actually. Did you actually know whether or not, or test whether or not, this jab would did anything to stop transmission before it went to market? And I think it's because most people just naturally assumed, good grief, if all of the medical community and your TV doctors and all of that are coming out and saying that you need to get it so you don't kill granny, surely someone's bothered to check whether or not this thing absolutely reduces transmission. Very lastly, Carl, because I am a bit over time here, I can't help but... People say politics is like showbiz for ugly people, right? I can't help but wonder whether a lot of the TV doctors, not yourself, of course, I'm not talking about you in this, TV docs and, and medical professionals that normally no one had ever heard of saw their chance to have 15 minutes of fame by pumping this vaccine, and I think that's what they did. What do you reckon? Well, look, I think it's 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 easy to come on TV and be overcautious and pull the government line. I think what you're saying is, can you say to us, where's the evidence to make these decisions? And nice, when you go back in time, when everybody was in restrictions, in lockdown, highly anxious, people were sent a message. And what you're seeing now is because that's all disappeared, people are starting to ask the important questions. Yeah. You're also pointing out, why didn't that happen earlier? I think it's an incredibly important point. And actually, there's only a few bits of the media, media that have been pointing fingers. But actually, it's now widening out because people are starting to open their, up their eyes. Yeah, Carl, look, thank you very much. Good luck with the petition and good luck with everything. It won't be the last time I speak to you, my good man, Carl Hannigan, there, director of the University of Oxford Centre of Evidence-Based Medicine. And the reason why we're talking to him is because there wasn't enough evidence-based medicine was there when it came to that coronavirus jab. Thank you very, very much. Right, coming up. As a new report finds a culture of fear is preventing the expression of free speech in UK universities, is the next generation doomed if they refuse to let their views be challenged? They're already doomed, for goodness sake. When I go out and ask them about politics, they just go, they be like the NHS, Tory the evil. We're absolutely knackered. Social media sensation Zuby has been speaking out about this epidemic of, quote, intellectual unfitness. He, thankfully, is uncancelled at 10.40. But first, after the home of the European Parliament attempts to cancel Jesus Christ, it makes me want to say Jesus Christ, actually, and limits the sale of crucifixes at its Christmas market, is wokeism determined to kill off Christianity? My superstar panel return for that. Plus, more newspaper front pages will arrive hot off the press in the media buzz. And that is next. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria De Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie's. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week.
Welcome back, everybody. Let's return now to tomorrow's news tonight in our Media Buzz. More front pages just hot off the press right here, ladies and gents. So we have got the front of the sun. There we are. Uh, underhand of God is the sun headline. Bit dramatic. There we are. Um, this is the news that the referee who awarded Diego Maradona's infamous Hand of God goal is set to rake in three million pounds by selling the match ball. So Ali bin Nasser missed the obvious handball that helped Argentina beat the Three Lions 2-1 in the 1986 World Cup quarter final. We were robbed. And no, of course, as a nation, we're not over it now. I, that's an interesting sun front page, given everything else we've got going on. But there we go. Who am I to diss the sun? Tomorrow's Telegraph is covering Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng's adamancy that he is not going anywhere. He says he's preparing to fight on, even as Number 10 prepares to ditch key policies from his recent mini-budget. We're over to The Guardian now, because we have to. The Guardian also covers talk of a trust tax U-turn, while a special report exposes the abuse of an 88-year-old dementia patient at the luxury Rygate Grange care home run by Signature Senior Lifestyle in Surrey this year. Gosh. The Independent leads with chilling notes, allegedly written by nurse Lucy Letby. This is harrowing stuff. Important to say, obviously, the trial continues and she denies everything. So, I am evil, I did this. Neonatal nurse Letby denies killing seven babies and attempting to kill ten others between June 2015 and June 2016 at the Countess of Chester Hospital. Her trial continues and we will be covering that live, by the way, on GB News throughout. So any developments, make sure you stay here with us for that in the coming days. More on the media buzz now with tonight's superstar panel, former Conservative London mayoral candidate Sean Bailey. We've got author and broadcaster Amy Nakal, who's got a massive new rock on her finger, <laughs> I don't know who we are, and political commentator and co-founder of the Conservatives Against Racism, it's Albie Amancona. Fantastic, I love this panel. I know I only get to cover the show every now and again, but I like it when I've got all three of you. Anyway, now, it appears, people, that not even Jesus Christ is safe from the... the I, I know, sometimes it just sounds like I'm making this up, I'm not. Not even Jesus Christ is safe from the scourge of cancel culture worming its way across the world. Green councillors in the French city of Strasbourg, home of the European Parliament, no less, have been accused of an idiotic, wokest bid to airbrush the son of God from their 500-year-old Christmas market. It's, well, the clue's the name as well. It's a Christmas market. Two Bob Town Hall politicians have limited the sale of crucifixes and instead rebanded them JC Crosses in an effort to stop the market turning into what they call consumerist amusement parks. Oh, yeah, that's right. You go to Winter Wonderland, you can't move for crucifixes, can you, for goodness <laughs> sake? Oh, gosh, well, you go, I'll bang my head on a crucifix on the way to the hot dog stand. Anyway, the Greens insisted that Van had nothing to do with Jesus or Christianity, despite literally being all about Jesus and Christianity. And they were instead trying to stop cheap Chinese imports in favour of locally made, better quality goods. They weren't saying that, were they telling you to well, wear masks? Anyway, the new rules spot mockery in the eastern French city with rival councillors asking when Jesus Christ had become a swear word and others joking that the man behind Christmas should not be named at all. Well, there we go. It comes as last year in the UK, confectionery giants such as Mars were slammed for removing the word Easter from their chocolate egg packaging. Meanwhile, in Whitehall, woke civil servants reportedly banned the use of the word Christmas in the office and on cars to prevent offending ethnic minority colleagues. So, panel. Oh, grief. Is wokeism determined to kill off Christianity once and for all? Sean Bailey, this is nuts. I'll tell you why this is important. Right. So you, you, you talked about the civil servants banning the use of the word Christmas. What's interesting is if you speak to anybody from any other religious hmm. belief, they want to celebrate Christmas because they want you to celebrate Diwali with them yeah. and Eid and all the, all the rest of it. So people from a religious belief have no problem with other people's religious um, ceremonies mm. and, and, and events across the year. Where this is problematic is it feels like the thin end of the wedge. So if you remove a cross, then when do you remove yeah. the Muslims? Well, when you do you remove the Sikhs? You can't do that. Yeah, but, but it will happen, and that's where people start to get a bit nervous. They came for me and I didn't defend them. When are they going to come for you? Mm. And I think people need to understand understand people's religion is fundamental to who they are yeah if we believe that we're civilized we should protect that not attack that and even a thing like this that seems small is a crucifix is it a cross is it a jc cross actually people have been 
using this symbol for 2,000 years. They know what it is by changing it. I think you, for them, you attack the religion. For me, you attack the religion. Everybody knows. How are they attacking the religion? Well, they're like, having a Christmas market. It's a market. It's, well, yeah, it's they're a still crucifix. selling them. They're calling them JC crosses. And I but think they're when not JC crosses. More closely, it's, yeah. it's literally just they wanted to source more local produce. That's all they were kind of well, doing. Do, this do is that. not woke. Wow. wow. This is not woke. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness <laughs> gracious me. My gosh. Well, Why Amy, not, Amy, Not everything Amy. comes back to what well, Amy, you, you wouldn't call the Quran the Q book, would you? Yeah. You just call it the Quran. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're having a Christmas market. Like, Amy, they love Jesus. Amy, they're having a whole festival for it. It might not be woke. It might not be politically correct, but it is stupid. And I think sometimes we just have to call things as they are. These are crucifixes. They're yeah. not JC crosses. I completely agree with them wanting to source more produce locally mm. and not get cheap imports from China. Yeah. Who could be angry at that? Who but could? calling a crucifix a JC cross, yeah. it's just stupid. I and why like... is it? Why is it the Greens that always come up with yeah, nonsense? And, and like a, a, fre a, a Green French councillor doesn't get to rename the no. symbol of the Son of Man. No. It, it's just not right. I don't think right. they renamed it. It's just it's. Well, they did. Look, so what what it, 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 it was called a crucifix. If you and now it's called a JC cross. If you speak to the Pope, isn't a JC cross? If you speak to the Pope or the Archbishop of Cranberry, neither of them will use the word. Neither of them will use the words JC cross. They wouldn't. They wouldn't no. do it. This, it's not a JC Cross. Before you read this article, if someone said JC Cross, what would you have thought it was? I'd have thought it was Jeremy. a place in South London. Or Jeremy Corbyn's angry. Um, but, but you're but, not yeah. erasing yeah. Jesus. Yeah. It's still his, like, you know, it's yeah, like, but my point let's is, not get too upset I'll be about look, it. I'm not, sure they would, I'm not sure they would have done this at, you know, at, at other religious festivals, yeah. right? I do think that Christians, sometimes Christians are deemed as easy targets because they just won't kick up a fuss. They're so nice. Yeah. Well, I apart from the Crusades, to be fair. I think it comes <laughs> from some ill-judged sort of desire to be more inclusive. When actually I think you can be inclusive, but at the same time respect the traditions of a country mm. and the religious traditions of where Christianity came from and how it's a quite but, important part of European culture. Let, I'm not even clear. religious and no. I think it's... Let's important. be clear, yeah. it is the basis of European culture. Exactly. Our laws come from there. But more importantly, you are not inclusive by excluding the largest group. That doesn't make you inclusive. I just realised what this is. This is the annual, oh, they're coming to cancel Christmas, they're going to rename it well, Winter, are, winter but Festival. People do, but and people it's getting, do that, Amy. I can't that, believe that you're happens. having this... It's, it's October every year. The debate comes earlier and earlier and earlier. It's fine. Christmas is safe. It's not going to be Winter Festival. Well, it Christmas isn't. If is According to those civil servants, it isn't safe. Yeah. They wanted to, to ban the world. My, 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 my neighbours celebrate Eid all the time. Me and my children go out and celebrate Eid. Brilliant. They come and celebrate Christmas. There's no part of them that wants to get rid of Christmas. My, my, my neighbours light a lot of fireworks at Eid, so my kids yeah. are well up for Eid. They're well up for it. <laughs> but the point, the point... They are. My, my son loves it. Yes, but, uh, Eid. <laughs> but, 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 but the point is, you've got to let people have their religious beliefs, have their, their, their traditions, and if you try to remove them yeah. and make us homogenous, what you'll do is just start people at each other's throat. I think the fact that we've been having this debate well, yeah. every year since, since Jesus Christ was born um, shows that Christmas isn't going Well, I'm sorry, they talk about, you know, the, they, they, they're trying to wrap it up as this, oh, we want to cut back on the importation of cheap Chinese goods, right? Well, most masks, frankly, were from China, as far as I could tell. They weren't against them in Strasbourg. I'm sorry, but it, if the burqa was all made in China, they certainly would not be banning that in Strasbourg. Let me tell you that yeah. much. I don't all, see why all they need the to do... Well, that's what tariffs are for. <laughs> if, you yeah. want, if you want to stop cheap crosses from China, get, put a tariff on them. OK, right, all of you, thank you very much. I will be seeing you again very shortly because we all crown our, our what is it, National Treasure Union jackass, whatever mm -hmm. it is. <laughs> I've covered this show loads of times and I can't remember what happens right at the end of it, but there we go. Coming up, <laughs> did King Charles really distrust? We will be discussing as I crown, here we go, the final greatest Britain and Union jackass of the week. It's almost like a practice, this. And as a new report finds a culture of fear is preventing the expression of free speech in UK universities, is the next generation doomed if they refuse to let their views be challenged? Social media sensation Zuby is uncancelled next, and he's speaking out against his epidemic of intellectual unfitness. That's his turn, by the way. But first, Mark Dolan is back on Monday, filling in for Dan. Where is Dan? Anyway, let's take a look at what's coming up. Coming up on Dan Wooten tonight with me, Mark Dolan. Are the Thought Police a real and present danger? Caroline Farrow, a mum of five and priest's wife, arrested in front of her kids over online posts. She speaks out on her horrific ordeal. 
There's no holds barred opinion from activist and broadcaster Tonya Buxton and my superstar panel, Sparks Will Fly. Plus, my daily digest, in which I'll be tackling the big news story of the day as I see it, and I won't be pulling my punches. That's Dan Wooten tonight with me, Mark Dolan, Monday to Thursday, 9 pm to 11 pm on GB News. Uh, that was I judge. thought maybe that. It's time now for Uncancelled. This is where Britain's top commentators speak out on controversial issues without the fear of cancel culture that's been sweeping the rest of the media and indeed the nation and Christmas markets in Strasbourg. Now, a worrying new report has found that free speech at universities is being constrained due to a culture of quiet, no platforming, which has created a climate of fear. The Higher Education Policy Institute has revealed that students are now acting more cautiously because of fallout from events at other institutions. This is how it happens, people. We've been saying this since the dawn of time, leading to various societies disinviting certain speakers over fears of a backlash. One man who certainly has a bone to pick with this is rapper and social media superstar sensation. It's Zuby, who says that it's leading our future generations to intellectual unfitness, basically stunting their mental growth. Zuby is uncancelled. There he is, yes, finally, yeah. I thought we had accidentally cancelled you then for a second, Zuby. Right, good stuff. So, <laughs> Zuby, what do you mean by this intellectual unfitness? By intellectual unfitness, I mean people lacking the capacity to critically think and argue and conversate and debate their ideas because they're not being challenged in any way. Just like you have to train your muscles or train your heart if you want to have good physical strength or cardiovascular fitness, you have to train your brain as well. If your ideas are never challenged and you're not learning anything new and you're not discussing and debating with people and arguing Wait. ideas, then it leads to intellectual unfitness. You don't have. It the does. It stunts do you it. intellectually. But Zuby, I I'm worried we've crossed. We've crossed the boundary. We've we've reached it. We've we've crossed the Rubicon because now what we're starting mm. to see is self censorship. So it's gone from having protesters at a university saying Jacob Rees Mogg is not welcome here to now them going, let's not invite Jacob Rees Mogg because it'd cause a problem. Yeah, well it, and that's an issue. That's right. And this has been going on for years. I mean, this is a new report that's come out, but we've been we've known about this for many years at this point. And it creates an overall chilling effect throughout society. I think that free speech isn't something that is just comes to whether or not someone can be arrested or prosecuted for things they say. But as far as I'm concerned, it's also a societal and cultural aspect. If people have free speech legally, but they feel like they're not even able to use it in any way, then mm. do you really have free speech? I think there's a difference between a silent majority, no, people like that term, and a silenced majority. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Could not agree more. And I am deeply concerned. I regularly go out every single day now, actually, and do vox pops with people where I ask the public questions about stuff. And I've actually almost stopped bothering to ask anyone under the age of 25 because when it comes to the political stuff, you just get one answer, which is, Tories are bad, Labour is good. And that must have come from school, it must have come from just TikTok or something. And it's this censorship because now they've got to conform to one view. And frankly, they're idiots. Yeah, well, universities have an extreme bias in terms of the uh, in terms of the political leanings. That's well known in academia. It's similar in some parts of the entertainment industry, but not as strongly as it is in academia. You've got whole universities without a single right leaning or conservative professor. And that's an issue. And then when you couple that with speakers being deplatformed and people not being allowed to hear the other side of any issue, then they're not prepared for the real world where you go into it. And there are billions of people out there and none mm -hmm. of us agree on absolutely everything. And you are going to have to argue your points and understand and be able to empathize with other ones. Well, and you know what? Sometimes alpha males or confident people, outgoing people, your more slightly stereotypical bloke, as it were, wins, right? Because actually they're dealing with a lot of weaklings a lot of the time. And, you know, it's unfortunate. I don't like to say it, but if you raise a generation of saps and simps, then actually, you know, it doesn't take much for people to rise to the top. People who are a bit confident, people who don't mind being a bit cocky at times and being a bit outgoing, and actually play to win. And that is what happens 
when you don't have winners and losers on sports days at primary school, Zuby. I hear that. Yeah, well, I think we need to, we want to encourage people to be physically fit and in good health, but we also want to encourage people to be mentally fit and mentally healthy. And I would argue that that includes being able to handle things that you may find potentially objectionable or certainly disagree with, things that could be potentially offensive and you can articulate rather than just screaming and ranting and name calling, you're able to articulate your positions better. And I think that if you are confident and you're good at speaking, and communicating with people, then that's oh. a very, very powerful, that's, that's a very powerful tool in your arsenal. But how do we stop it? Because we need a sea change now. We need to have a serious conversation with, frankly, teachers and university lecturers, and frankly, people just in authority. I mean, sometimes even people running the police force, for goodness sake, and say, let everyone be a bit offended. And if someone comes to you and says, I was offended by that, as long as it wasn't, you know, actually racist, criminal, sexist, misogynistic, basically a crime, an actual crime, then you're just going to have to suck it up. Yeah, well, I, would, I wouldn't even... I'm, I, the, even those caveats concern me because offence is very subjective. I think we all agree that there are certain things beyond the pale, for example, yeah. threatening violence or terroristic threats, that kind of thing. But in terms of what people find offensive, it's extremely subjective. And if we go down this road of increasingly criminalizing things that various people could potentially find subjectively offensive, then that's when people start getting arrested for jokes or arrested from uh, preaching from the Bible or the Quran or just stating oh. an opinion online and so on. And that's a, that's a problem. If we're going to have free speech, then I understand it can be messy. I understand sometimes people say things that we don't like, and that's true for all of us. But I don't think the correct way to approach that is to censor people, to shut people down, to deplatform them. I think that the best way is to allow them to speak and to use yeah. your own free speech to combat that. I can't help but wonder whether or not this country has absolutely sleptwalked into part of a bigger plan, probably started by Tony Blair, because as far as I can tell, all things bad came from Blair. But where actually we've slowly indoctrinated generations, younger generations, into, I would argue, you know, a lot of the kind of left-wing, sopping wet thought. And that now is playing its way through. And I can't but wonder whether or not we just allowed that to happen a bit. Do you think there was some kind of agenda at play here? That's a tricky one to answer. I don't know how much of an agenda it is per se, but I think that if you don't use your free speech, then you lose your free speech. And I think that once there is this ossification of one way of thinking in a very narrow Overton window, then it becomes a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy because people who are, whether you're in school or in university or you're in a corporate environment or you're online, people feel that chill. And as you said before, they start to self-censor. It's not that they are being censored or being deplatformed all, right. all the times, but they themselves are biting their own tongue more than they need to. Now, yeah. you don't need to, it's, it's foolhardy to express every single thought that comes to your brain. We yes. know that that's not how you operate, but you shouldn't be terrified and afraid to state very basic opinions or even facts around certain issues. Yeah, or, or honestly how believe with that. Well. Honestly, help, please. Well, Zuby, thank you. Zuby, Absolutely. thank you very much. Great to have you on the show. Always a pleasure, my good man. Zuby, there, rapper and host of the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. Make sure you check that out. But not at the time this show's on. Watch this instead. Thank you very, very much. Well, it's time now. Here we go, people. Ladies and gentlemen, strap yourselves in to reveal today's greatest Britain and Union jackass. With me to reveal theirs is my superstar panel: former Conservative London Mayor or candidate Sean Bailey. Author and broadcaster Amy Nicole and political commentator and co-founder of Conservatives Against Racism, Albie Amancona. Let's start with the union jackass, mainly because it's written right at the bottom of my screen there. I will start with you, Sean. Here's your jackass. My union jackass is Nicola Sturgeon for her comment she is tests the Tories. <laughs> how are we meant to have any kind of decent political debate? How are we meant to get our children to be able to agree to disagree when we have such oh. detestable leaders? Can I just apologise? I'll, I'll apologise, everybody, especially to my production team, because I decided to do Jackass first. Apparently, I should have done Greatest Britain. So, sorry, sorry. Well, anyway, Sean's Union Jackass nominee is Nicola Sturgeon, MSP, um, and Amy... Amy, we're still on the jackass. I'm getting shouted at here. Apologies. Amy, who's your jackass? It's uh, so my jackass, honorary jackass, is um, Alex Jones for finally 
getting what he deserved um, after being held to account in court for the Sandy Hook conspiracy theories that he so joyously peddled. OK, that's your jackass. And, Albie, go on, hit me with your jackass. My union jackass, which might not be a surprise, is, of course, Mr Gary Lineker, who has finally been done for breaking BBC impartiality rules. But I just wonder that, as he is a black man, whether or not he's <laughs> going to... whether or not he's going to claim <laughs> that he's been racially discriminated against. Well, I'd be really interested to see where this case goes on that basis. <laughs> I, 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 I vote for Albie straight away. That's excellent. Uh, it, it, the winner of the Union Jackass is obviously Gary Lineker. Yes, Albie, thank you very, very much. Right, OK, Greatest Britain. Sorry about this, everybody. Sean, go on, take it away. Greatest Britain. My Greatest Britain is Ed Vasey, who is yeah. chairing a group that are looking to return the Elgin marbles. I think these things need to be looked at case by case, but okay. Greece has been begging for this stuff for so long, it's time to give it back. All right, can't believe you went for that. Anyway, right, OK, Amy, go on. Uh, mine's King Charles. Um, what? For his dear, oh, dear reception <laughs> to Liz Truss. Ah. Uh, which just spoke for the nation, really, and I really would like printed on a T-shirt. I did wonder why you were going King Charles. It had to be some snidey little reason. Albie, go on. <laughs> so, my greatest Britain this week is probably not someone that anyone's seen in the media that much recently, but it's Penny Morden, because she had an absolutely brilliant performance, I think, today in Thursday Business Questions and a great response uh, okay. when the shadow leader of the House, Tangham Debonair, said to her that she didn't look very happy in Prime Minister's Questions yeah. yesterday. To which she responded that she just has a resting face that looks like she's swallowed a wasp. Yes. So I thought that it was a, 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 a great demonstration of Penny Morden's ability okay. at the dis dispatch box. Good stuff. Right, OK. Well, I'll tell you what, the winner actually is going to be Amy. OK, Amy Nicole with King Charles, but not for the reason that you said, just because he's king, actually. So, you know, <laughs> I have that. All right, OK, look, thank you very, very much, all of you. It's been fantastic. That is it from me. I just want to say thank you to my superstar panel. Mark Dolan will be back in for the one and only Dan Woodson on Monday. But right now, it's time for Headliners. I'm Alex Deakin with your latest weather update. Good evening to you. The next few days will continue to bring chopping and changing weather. Yes, at times there'll be plenty of October sunshine, but there'll be lots of showers around as well and often fairly breezy, especially in the north. Weather fronts moving across the north and then we have this waving weather front close to the south. In between, well, there's been plenty of fine weather through the day today, but now these weather fronts are pushing in across Scotland and Northern Ireland. Further rain to come in the northwest. Very blustery conditions here as well. The winds are lighter further south. Misty, murky conditions developing again, so a few fog patches are likely. It won't be as cold as last night. Temperatures in many towns and cities staying in double digits. On to Friday, and it's a bit of a mishmash, really. Cloud and rain in the southwest, just slowly spreading northwards. At the same time, this line of rain uh, clears from the central belt of Scotland, spreads into southern Scotland and eventually into parts of northern England, followed by lots of showers across Scotland and Northern Ireland. But in between, some parts of northern England, North Wales, having another dry and a bright day. Quite mild in the south, 17, 18, but not feeling all that mild with the cloud the outbreaks of rain will still be around on Friday evening across the southeast before that scoots away. This line of rain kind of fizzles out as it sinks its way southwards. So, again, 